Hello, I'm Steve, and welcome to our second episode of Practical Uses of Geology, a basic understanding of stratigraphy. Now, what stratigraphy is, is it is the study of how rock units in the actual earth itself relate and interact with each other. Now, over time, they move and behave like fluids, rocks do. But in the present, pretty much, they're solid. And so with that basic knowledge of our small, tiny little human lifespans compared to the entire age of the Earth, we can do things like make geologic maps and map geologic units. Stratigraphy, and stratigraphy, especially lithostratigraphy, which is the most commonly used form of stratigraphy when it comes to making geologic maps, and making cross sections through the earth and things like that. Lithostratigraphy studies rock units based on lithology. And lithology is a combination of texture, composition, grain size, and all that. And at the earth's surface, you have many individual disciplines within stratigraphy. You have sedimentology, you have uh, um, study of igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks. And those are our three basic rock types that we use in geology. Sedimentary, which are most common at Earth's surface. And the three main types are sandstone, limestone, and shale. Sandstone is mostly quartz, sand, Although you can have different, you can have sand made out of things other than quartz because sand is a function of grain size and not a function of composition. But we're not going to go into too great a detail of that because that's a whole nother course altogether. Limestone or carbonates, I'm just going to use limestone here as an example. You also have dolo stones and, and other carbonate rocks, is made, is made up of calcite. These two we looked at in the mineralogy section. Shale is mostly derived of clays which are formed through the alteration of minerals. Things like uh, boulders and cobbles and pebbles and sand and silt are really nothing more than broken down pieces of larger rock. Now shale, which is made up mostly of clays and silts, but the clay aspect of shale, clay is actually formed through the alteration of minerals. Your largest clay particles can be bigger than your smallest silt particles. So there's a gray area. An engineer would never admit to that because they put a definite line between the division of silt and clay just as a definition. Um, so these are your three basic types of sedimentary rocks. And then we have our other two types, which are fairly common but not as common as sedimentary. Igneous rocks are formed directly by cooling of magma, either one way or another. Um, either at the surface or underground or through a lava flow or a pyroclastic flow or an ash flow, whatever, gives us igneous rocks. Uh, granites are igneous, uh, basalts are igneous, like I said, ash flows are igneous. Uh, those are basic types of igneous rocks. And then we have metamorphic rocks, which are altered igneous and sedimentary and altered metamorphic rocks. If a rock unit is buried deep enough with enough heat and pressure, it will begin to undergo metamorphism. That's probably a better way of saying it. And you get metamorphic rocks, and depending on the depth, pressure, and amount of water and other fluids in there, will give you certain types of metamorphic rocks. For example, that's buried about a mile so down or a couple miles down and a little higher temperature because as you go towards the center of the earth uh, the temperature goes up. Um, just in a nice gradient but we're not going to get into too much detail on that. Um, but a sandstone under moderate heat and pressure becomes a quartzite. Quartzite is a metamorphic version of sandstone. 
and a metamorphic version of limestone is marble, and a metamorphic version of shale is slate, argillite, and a whole bunch of other different, different ones. And if any of these rocks are put under enough heat and pressure and deep burial, before they start to melt and become igneous again, because once rocks melt, they become, uh, it becomes magma and liquid, and liquid is not technically a rock or mineral. But once that liquid re-solidifies, it becomes an igneous rock again. So it's a whole cycle referred to as the rock cycle. And, um, but most rocks under enough heat and pressure just before melting will become uh, what we call gneisses. And it's real hard in some gneisses, especially that have been buried deep, deep underground and brought back to the surface exactly what their original rock type was. Um, the basic unit, of a the, the basic formal unit of a lithostratigraphic rock is called the formation. The formation is the basic unit in lithostratigraphy. And what is a formation? Well, a formation is a sequence of rocks both laterally and vertically into the subsurface or at the surface that share similar lithological characteristics and can be mappable at a mappable scale. Now mappable scales vary. I mean if you're doing a whole state you can't very well map a hundred foot thick formation um, but it depends on the scale too. But that's the basic unit is the formation and that definition leaves a big wide range of of interpretation. Now in the uh, field documentaries, geo documentaries I show you, um, you've heard me refer to rocks um, as, and talking about them as units. You've heard me mention the St. Peter, Wanawak, and so on and so on and so on. Now when I talk about these, these are formations and these are the basic unit in lithostratigraphy. Now, the, the St. Peter is generally a clean sandstone. The Glenwood is an impure, finer grain sandstone similar to the St. Peter and is often referred to as the repeater uh, informally, but it contains shale and limestone as well. This can be greater than 300 feet thick. This is generally less than 50 feet. The Lone Rock is also a sandstone made up of different members um, and most are impure they got a lot of glauconite in it and stuff like that. And that can be a couple hundred feet thick. And the Wanawak is basically a clean quartz sandstone as well. And that can be about a couple hundred feet thick. I think to about 300 if memory serves me correctly. 300 feet thick. Now, that's just some names of things you've heard me talk about in the uh, geo uh, guides out in the field. Now. The formation isn't the only division in lithostratigraphy. Now you can break this down more into members or break it down further into beds. And there are other units equivalent to members, tongues, and lenses. As where a member tends to be a flat continuous unit, a tongue like it suggests is a unit that intertongues with something. So in cross section, this is cross section, a member will be flat like this. A tongue will come in and intertongue with something else. And a lens, just like it suggests, is a, it looks like a flat line lens of glasses or anything else. That's a lens. Now a bed is usually like a member, except it's thinner. And in order to become a formal unit, a bed needs to be very distinct and continuous, and they're generally very thin. Although, theoretically, they can be any thickness. Now members and beds do not have to be mappable like a formation does. Um, they're usually used to talk about continuous units over long distances and things like that in order to better understand the formation itself. And usually a formation is defined before these are. 
Now you can go the other way too. You can group formations together and a group of formations is called a group. Now formations do not have to be part of any group and a group does not have to be divided strictly into formations. And the combination of groups is a supergroup. Now that's the basic construct of lithostratigraphy. Now I'm going to show you how this applies in the real world and what I'm actually going to do is I am going to show you in the field how this process works and the naming of rock units works. But before I do, I want to make a quick note. Geologic units have to be named after semi-permanent features at the Earth's surface. They can be named after towns, rivers, ridges, lakes. Um, you want to, although not against the stratigraphic code, and there is this code of stratigraphy that guides all this stuff together, and out here we use the North American stratigraphic code, which can be found online just by doing a search. Um, but you want to avoid names of things that tend to change names. Like you don't want to name a formation after a street. You don't want to name a formation after a school or some building or something like that. And you definitely cannot name formations after people. You can't sit there and say, oh, my wife Beth, you know, she really likes this rock. I'm going to name this formation the Beth Formation. You can't do that. A formal stratigraphic unit has to be named after a semi-permanent place and those places are usually pulled directly off of topo maps. It's the easiest way to do it without any controversy. And then in order to become formal you have to write up a paper, get it peer-reviewed and put it into a uh, journal and then it becomes recognized as, an, as a formal unit 